Hello, welcome. I'm Dr. Stanley Truskin. Um, I had put together these educational sessions for my patients with thyroid problems, and I was doing it in person uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, because of the uh, global pandemic with coronavirus, it's no longer possible to put together uh, patients and their families in a classroom. So we're going to put together this educational session via YouTube and I'd like my patients who are going to come see me for the first time to have viewed it. We're going to talk in this educational session about the anatomy of the thyroid, goiters, thyroid function, thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, and then we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of thyroid operations. Anatomy. The thyroid gland is located very superficially in the neck, and it's right under the skin. We define a big thyroid as one that you could see or feel. So, if you use this anatomic landmark, the Adam's apple, the thyroid gland is below it and it wraps around the windpipe or trachea as shown in this illustration over here. So there's the Adam's apple. This is the windpipe or trachea. The lungs are down here. You take a deep breath in, the vocal cords, which are right behind the Adam's apple, will open up like this. Air will go down into the lungs. Now, if you looked at it from the side, you can see the normal thyroid gland is around the trachea. This is the swallowing tube, the esophagus, and the thyroid gland is always on it. Now, the first topic we're going to talk about is the term goiter. Goiter means the thyroid gland is big, but it's not cancer. There are two ways the thyroid gland gets big. The whole gland can get enlarged when it gets inflamed. Inflammation of the thyroid is called thyroiditis. The thyroid can also get big because it's made of nodules. And here's a patient who has a giant goiter, an enlargement of the thyroid that's not cancer. And you can see through the skin the outline of multiple thyroid nodules. Now, goiters occur today fairly commonly. They were much more common at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Iodine is a major component of thyroid hormone. Any iodine you take in is going to go into your thyroid or it's going to pass through into the sewer system. In New Jersey, we never have iodine deficiency. Most of the iodine on the Earth's surface is in the sea. And if you eat any homegrown vegetables, wheat, any veg anything grown in New Jersey soil is going to be rich in iodine. If you were growing up at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century in Minnesota, totally landlocked, a lot of people had iodine deficiency and could get goiter, sometimes getting this big. As a public health measure, iodine in small amounts was added to salt. So no one gets a goiter in this country or the industrialized world because salt has iodine added to it. And if you look closely at Morton salt, the label on it, and diamond crystal salt and some kosher salts, there'll be an I, big I which means that some iodine was added to it just to prevent that reason for people getting goiters. They still get them today, even without iodine deficiency. No one's exactly sure why that's the case. Now, the thyroid gland can grow in any direction. If one side gets large over here, one of the first things we're going to notice is that the windpipe gets pushed to the other side. If it gets big on both sides, it's going to start to press on the trachea. Normally in cross-section, the trachea is a circle, but it will get compressed into an oval and eventually a slit 
by a large thyroid gland. Now usually that takes a long time for that to happen and people get used to it and I'll have a patient come to the office and they'll go from the chair to the examining table and they'll start to huff and puff and I'll say the obvious, are you short of breath? And their comment usually is, Dr. Truska and I always, I'm always like this. They notice a difference when we remove the thyroid because almost immediately the trachea opens up, becomes a circle again, and they can tell the difference when they wake up. They say, oh, I'm so much more comfortable breathing, I'm comfortable lying down. Now, if the side of the thyroid gets very big or has a, a nodule on it, it's going to cause swallowing issues and people will say, oh, I have this sticking sensation when I swallow and it's worse with steak than it is with juice. Now, not everyone who has that feeling of difficulty swallowing or a pressure sensation when they swallow or a sticking sensation is it due to the thyroid pressing from the outside? It can also be that the muscles in the wall of the soft esophagus don't contract rhythmically in waves to put the food you just chewed down into your stomach. The way we tell the difference, we can have them swallow some barium. You can see an outline of the esophagus with an indentation from the thyroid nodule. You can get a CT scan and you can see the thyroid nodule abutting right against the esophagus or a gastroenterologist can look down there and if it's something on the inside of the esophagus like a tumor, the gastroenterologist can see it and do a biopsy of it. So if the thyroid gland grows upward above the level of the Adam's apple, then we're going to be concerned that it could block the airways. It can grow down into the chest, you have a perfectly normal appearing neck and you get a CT scan and you see a shadow or an x-ray and you see a shadow. Over here it's the thyroid growing down in the neck. Now you can see on this CT scan, this is a normal CT scan, the thyroid would normally be over here and this space is relatively small. If the thyroid gland goes down into the chest and is wider than this space, or goes down and wraps around these blood vessels, then you have to cut the breastbone to take it out. That's a much bigger deal. So in summary, operation is the only treatment for a large goiter. There isn't a medication that's going to make it shrink up. If it's pushing the trachea over, if it's pressing on the esophagus, growing above the level of the vocal cords, growing down into the chest, those are indications to operate not for cancer, but because it's pressing on the structures in the neck or the upper chest. What does the thyroid gland do and how does it do it? The thyroid gland is responsible for metabolism. And metabolism is how the body burns calories. What does that mean? Well, if you take in 1,500 calories a day and you burn 1,500 calories a day, your weight's going to stay stable. If you take in 1,200 calories, you burn 2,000. Over time, you'll lose weight. And if you take in 2,500 and you burn 1,500, over time, you're going to gain weight. Now, how your body burns the calories day to day, week to week, is controlled by the amount of hormone levels made by your thyroid gland. Now thyroid hormones have a what's called a permissive relationship on metabolism. If you have the right amount of thyroid hormone in the blood, day after day after day, you're not going to gain or lose weight related to how you burn calories. The calories that have the direct effect on how you burn glucose and fats minute to minute are made by these little glands that sit on top of the kidneys called the adrenal glands. They make adrenaline. And adrenaline, minute to minute, is responsible for what's called the fight or flight response. So you can visualize it this way. You're a prehistoric man or woman. The saber-toothed tiger is looking at you lovingly as a good lunch snack and starts 
to come after you and you start to run. Your brain is going to appreciate the danger and send a signal both through nerves and through hormones to your adrenal glands and a bolt of adrenaline is going to be released in the system. Adrenaline is going to increase your heart rate so your heart's going to beat faster. It's going to increase the blood pressure, increase the strength of how your heart pumps with each beat and the end result is more oxygen is going to be delivered to the tissues and your muscles going to be able to contract faster, stronger and you're going to try to be able to outrun the saber-toothed tiger and as you do that you're going to burn more calories. Now when people have too much thyroid hormone in the blood it's like they always are on an adrenaline surge. Even though the adrenaline levels will be normal, normal, the effect of adrenaline is magnified. So when people are hyperthyroid, it's as if they have too much adrenaline effect, they burn more calories, they lose weight, their hands may shake, it's called tremors. They may be more agitated, so they undergo a little bit of a personality transformation. And in the extreme, they can have heart rhythm disturbances and wind up in the end intensive care unit to get treated for high blood pressure. That's what hyperthyroid is like because there's too much thyroid hormone, too much adrenaline effect. Now if you don't have enough thyroid hormone in the blood, it's like you don't have enough adrenaline and you can't burn the calories so you're going to gain weight. People are going to be tired. They don't feel like getting out of bed in the morning and their skin will get dry and their hair will get brittle and crack every organ in the body has a particular architecture. And we know this because of a microscope. In a microscope there are two lenses. There's one that's near the eyepiece, there's one that's further down, and then there's a light source at the bottom. And if you're going to look at tissue under the microscope to discover and study the architecture, the tissue has to be sliced incredibly thin so you could see light through it. Now the way that's done is it's plopped in formaldehyde overnight, put into wax or paraffin. It's very firm, a very sharp blade, a microtome will slice it and it's sliced so thin you can actually see light through it. And then stains are put on it to bring out the details, either a pink stain or a blue, a blue dye. And this is what the thyroid looks like under the microscope. So you can see these circles here and here. Now these circles, whenever pathologists see a circle with cells on the outside, here you can see just the bare outline of the circle. These are cells in a circle. They're called follicular cells. Those are the normal cells that make thyroid hormone. In the middle is this pink stuff. This pink stuff, whenever pathologists see pink like that, they call it colloid. So you can see colloid you see cells. This is normal thyroid tissue. The follicular cells, they're the th cells that make thyroid hormones. The colloid, the stuff in the middle, the stuff in the middle is pink because it takes up a dye. There's a protein in it, a very specific protein called thyroglobulin. And I'm going to burden you with that technical name because it's important for my patients who have thyroid cancer. Only follicular cells make thyroglobulin. No other cells in the body can make it. Part of the treatment for common types of thyroid cancer, papillary follicular herthal cell, we'll, we'll talk more about it in detail, is to get rid of all the follicular cells. Now, if you have thyroid tissue in the body, the thyroglobulin is going to spill into the blood. You could do a blood test and you can measure thyroglobulin. I still have my thyroid. There's going to be thyroglobulin that's spilled into the blood. That's normal. But if you've effectively treated the thyroid cancer and you've gotten rid of all the follicular cells, the cancer cells, the normal cells, there's going to be no thyroglobulin in the blood. And when you have a protein that you can measure that tells you how your treatment is going, it's called a tumor marker. So under the circumstances of removing all the thyroid tissue, 
and you measure the thyroglobulin every six months, if it's unmeasurable or very low, it's very low and all of a sudden it starts to go up, that tells you that you have to deal with the cancer again. Now, here's an illustration of a follicle. In three dimensions, it's going to look like a marble. You have the follicular cells on the outside, you have colloid in the middle, and there are other cells, the parafollicular cells, are a cell that's a combination of hormone producer and a nerve cell. If you look at it under the microscope very closely, you see these little pink cells. These are the fo follicular cells. This is the inside of the follicle. This is the colloid. This is what normal thyroid tissue looks like. The cytoplasm stains pink. The DNA usually stains a darker blue. Now, those little follicular cells that I just showed you right here, these are the cells that make the thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is one of the simplest chemicals in the body. It's one of the simplest chemicals in the body. Essentially, it's a specific amino acid. Amino acids are the building blocks of life. In this case, the amino acid is tyrosine. And thyroid hormone is tyrosine with iodine attached to it. There are two types of thyroid hormones. There's T3 and T4. Now, any iodine that's in your body, as I said before, is going to be part of thyroid hormone in your thyroid or circulating in the blood as part of attached iodine to tyrosine. It's going to be nowhere else in the body. No other cells in the body have any use for iodine. T3 and T4 are defined as T3 having three iodines attached to the tyrosine. It's very fast acting. Now, once the chemical structure of T3 and T4, T4 has four iodines attached to it, once that was figured out, it was really easy for scientists to say, okay, we'll make it in the lab, synthetic thyroid. So T3 if you didn't have enough thyroid hormone in the blood, you could take T3. T3 is the active hormone. And there are only a few brands. Cytomel and lyothyronine are the brands. The problem with taking it is that it's very fast acting and it doesn't hang around the blood long. So if you took it in the morning, a couple hours later you'd have a lot of energy. A couple hours after that you'd be real tired again. And you'd have to take it. And your energy level would be like this, up and down, up and down. Now, T4 is long-acting. You only have to take it once a day. It's like a slow-release medication in the sense that the liver and the kidney have enzymes that can take off an iodine and convert it into the active hormone T3. Now, the original synthetic thyroid was named Synthroid. Now, I don't know if they hired a fancy advertising firm and charged $3 million to come up with the name, or they sat around the table and said, oh, synthetic thyroid, let's call it Synthroid. Now, this medication has been around for over 50 years. So the patent ran down, and then hundreds of companies worldwide make generics. Now, your drug plan wants you to take the generic because it's cheaper, and they have different names levothyroxine, levoxyl, L-thyronine, L-thyroid, on and on. And it's pennies a day. It's very inexpensive. For 99% of the population, you can take the generic. Now, T3 and T4 are a powder. We don't take powders. We want to take exact doses. So it's made into a pill. And when you make something into a pill, you have to put fillers in it to give it its size, shape, and color. If one of those fillers is something you're allergic to, well, your endocrinologist is going to have to fill out all the extra paperwork to get you the more expensive Synthroid. Again, 99.9% .9 of the population, the generic's fine. 100 micrograms of T4, whether it's Synthroid or Levoxyl, is 100 micrograms of T4. How does your body know that you have enough thyroid hormone in the blood to have normal metabolism? 
there is this little gland at the base of the brain called the pituitary gland. It makes its own hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone that signals the thyroid to take up more iodine, make more thyroid hormone, and store it in the colloid, and then release it. When we talk about the pituitary hormone, TSH, what does it do? It regulates thyroid hormone synth synthesis. If you have more TH, you're going to make more thyroid hormone. It's going to increase the size of the follicular cells and the number. In short, it makes thyroid tissue grow. And if it's up for a long, long time, it's going to lead to a goiter. And that's the reason why people in Minnesota at the turn of the 19th to 20th century had a high incidence of goiter. They had low iodine. They were borderline hypothyroid. TSH was continuously high, and they developed large goiters. When we talk about thyroid function studies, in this day and age, you can look at all your results online. If you know how to do it, thyroid function studies are usually the free T4 and the TSH. And you can look at it yourself and figure out whether you have normal thyroid function because there's going to be a range in parenthesis of what's normal at the results. Always look at the T4 first. If you have a high T4, you're going to be hyperthyroid. The TSH is going to tell you what your pituitary is thinking. And if your pituitary is not putting out TSH, they think you're hyper enough. If you're hypothyroid, again, look at the T4. The T4 is going to be low. So always look at the T4 first. If you're hyperthyroid, it's going to be high. If you're hypothyroid, it's going to be low. Now, thyroid medication, thyroid replacement for people who are hypothyroid is a life-changing medication. Why is it life-changing? You have to take it in a very specific way. Because it is based on an amino acid, it is going to be absorbed rapidly, the same way any amino acid gets absorbed. The issue is that you can only take it with water. You can't take it with coffee, tea, juice, beer, only water. So you have to have an empty stomach. The best time to take it is first thing in the morning. Then you wait an hour. Then you can have your coffee. You can have breakfast. You can take your other medications. Synthetic versus natural thyroid. If you Google natural thyroid, you'll get a thousand hits. And a lot of people say, oh, that's what you should have because it's a mixture of T3 and T4. What is natural thyroid? Well, natural thyroid was the first thyroid replacement. Armor thyroid is an example of natural thyroid. Armor company, not Under Armour, but Armor thyroid is made in Chicago in the meat packing district. And the pigs, when they're given up their bacon and their ham, give up their thyroids. They're placed on large pallets put into drying ovens. All the moisture is removed, dried out. The thyroid is then ground up into a powder and made into a pill. Now, this was a life-saving medication before the chemical structure of T3 and T4 was known. They even had a made-up unit of strength, and it was called grains. These days, you can get a rough idea of how much T3 and T4 is in um, armor thyroid, but the absorption is going to depend on what other pig fat, pig carbohydrate, pig amino acid, and protein is there that could affect the absorption. Once you get controlled on the synthetic thyroid, as long as you don't gain or lose weight for other reasons, as long as you don't gain or lose weight for other reasons, um, that's your dose. Now, the most frequently asked question I get is, Dr. Truskin, if you take out my thyroid, will I gain weight? And the answer is everyone gets under control eventually. When I operate on people and take out their thyroid, I figure out their first dose based on an equation in their body weight. It takes four weeks to get even blood levels.
if you miss doses, four, five, six days later, your blood levels will go down and it'll take a while for it to come back up again. So you don't want to miss doses. If you forget to take it in the morning, you wait till you have an empty stomach, take it later in the day. If you forgot the whole day, that's not great, take two the next day. The easiest way to do this is to set it up on your night table. The night before, you wake up in the morning, you have a little water there, you take your pill, an hour later you're good to go for breakfast. Why do people become hyperthyroid? The most common reason is called thyroiditis, inflammation in the thyroid gland. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. You can see all these little blue cells, those are lymphocytes. And the other name for thyroiditis is Hashimoto's or lymphocytic thyroiditis. You can also become hyperthyroid because there's one lump, one nodule in the thyroid that overfunctions, or multiple nodules that overfunctions. Thyroiditis is the most common cause, the overwhelming number of patients who have hyperthyroid or hyperthyroid is due to thyroiditis. In thyroiditis, there is an immune globulin there that stimulates the follicular cells to overproduce thyroid hormone. Now, eventually, the follicular cells will have enough of that and will program their own cell death. And as you lose follicular cells, you're going to lose follicles. They get replaced with scar tissue. The thyroid gland can get very big or can get small and contracted. But eventually, it's going to make less thyroid hormone. And over time, if that continues, people have normal thyroid. They'll be hyperthyroid have normal thyroid function, and then they're going to need to take thyroid medication because they're hypothyroid. So you have one disease, thyroiditis, that's responsible for people being hyperthyroid. They can have normal thyroid function or be hypothyroid. What's different is the time course. For some people, it can be just a few months. Some people can bounce between being hyperthyroid, having normal thyroid function, then be hyperthyroid again. Sometimes it can be decades. Initially, the medications that one takes, if it's going to be a short run, are called methamazole. The generic is called tapazole. The generic is methamazole, rather. The proprietary is tapazole or propothiuracil. So if it's going to be a few months, the endocrinologist will give you that medication to control it. It blocks the uptake of iodine and the release of thyroid hormone. If it's going to go on for some time, there's two ways to treat it. One way is to remove the thyroid gland. The most difficult operations that a surgeon can do on the thyroid is in patients with thyroiditis because of all the scar tissue and inflammation. It's a very delicate operation, I'll tell you about later. Um, and I use very fine instruments. There's sometimes the scar tissue is so thick, I wish I had some of my tools at home, like a chisel and a hammer. And it separates the occasional thyroid surgeon from the experienced one because the occasional thyroid surgeon is going to have more complication when they operate on thyroiditis because of the degree of difficulty. Now iodine exists in nature in forms with a different number of electrons. So I-123 you can take in a pill form. It doesn't have a lot of energy. You can measure with a Geiger counter-like device the amount of iodine that stays in the thyroid people who are hyperthyroid due to thyroiditis, it's increased. And you can get a picture of the uptake. And in people with thyroiditis, it's patchy throughout the whole gland. Iodine exists as I-131. You can measure the amount, you can get a picture, but it kills the energy that gets concentrated within the follicular cells, kills them off. 
99% of the people who are treated with I-131 are going to go through this course over a few months where they have normal thyroid function, it's improved, and then they're hypothyroid. 99% of people who are treated with I-131 are going to take thyroid medication every day forever because they don't have any functional follicular cells. They're replaced with scar tissue. Now, this is a less common reason people become hyperthyroid, and this is a scan with I-123. And you can see the thin outline of the normal thyroid tissue, and down over here, left lobe, you see this intense black. That's called the hot nodule. All the I-123 went to this spot. And people have a solitary toxic nodule. If you remove this part, the remaining thyroid tissue is normal. And you don't have to take thyroid hormone every day forever. So the treatment for toxic nodules remove that side. Thyroid nodules. Now we're going to switch to a topic and talk about one of the most common reason people come to see me is because they have a lump in their thyroid. And first thing you have to know is that thyroid nodules are very common. 5% of the population have nodules you could see or feel. And if you did an ultrasound to screen people, which we don't want to do because you would find that 33%, a third of the population who has an ultrasound of their thyroid is going to have a nodule. Most of these are going to be small. 95 out of 100 times, a thyroid nodule is going to be benign. Only 5% of the time it's cancer. So if you think 5% of the population, if there's over 300 million people in this country, 15 million people as nodules you could see or feel, that's a huge number. You don't want to operate to figure out that there is cancer in everyone because most people, they're not going to have it. And then you're subjecting them to a risk of a delicate operation uh, for no good reason. So we do a very deliberate evaluation and we take our sweet time about it. All to avoid unnecessary operations. Can we afford the slow and deliberate evaluation? The answer is yes. Why is it yes? Well. The most common type of thyroid cancer is called papillary thyroid cancer. 90% of people are cured. 7% live with it as a chronic disease. It's present. It doesn't grow. It just sits there. And only 3% is it aggressive. Why is that? Why do we get such great results? First of all, it's slow growing. Now, we're not conditioned to think about cancer being slow growing. We're conditioned to think about, I have cancer, this is going to kill me. Everybody who has a diagnosis of cancer has that thought process. But not every cancer in reality grows rapidly. Some cancers grow very, grow very slowly. We call that the biology of the cancer. Now, slow growing cancers have better outcomes than rapidly growing cancers, but it gives you a different mindset. One of them is it's very difficult to say a patient's cured. In my professional lifetime, in treating women who had breast cancer, which I did in the past, we went from doing this disfiguring operation to remove the breast, the muscle underneath, the lymph nodes underneath the armpit, People got swollen arms. We found out very quickly that you could do less of an operation till today. We just remove the tumor, a little bit of surrounding tissue, and a few lymph nodes, and can get better results than we got in the past. We found out that that was the case because women volunteered to be part of trials and have different operations, and within five years we could tell. Now, five years for somebody who has papillary thyroid cancer is too short of a time to see if there's any difference because the tumor, the cancer, is so slow growing. In fact, 20% of people will have microscopic disease left usually in their neck. By definition, 
Microscopic means you can't see it or feel it. And it's very common for my patients after the operation to say, Dr. Truskin, did you get it all? And my answer is always the same, I don't know. I got everything I could see or feel. It doesn't mean that I got everything. Now, that residual disease could grow and get identified sometime in the future. Now, for some people, it can be six months. In other people, it can be 50 years. And I've had patients who 50 years previously, they had this huge operation, they get a lump in their neck. One gentleman when is in his 70s, we biopsied, it was papillary thyroid cancer. It was in a lymph node 55 years ago. That's how slow growing it is. So it's very difficult to tell people that they're gonna be cured. Now, not everybody is at high risk to have to deal with it again. We'll have microscopic disease left. The American Thyroid Association divides patients, stratifies them to low, intermediate, and high risk. Low risk, the cancer's small. It's not growing outside the thyroid. It's not growing into little blood vessels. And there may be no lymph nodes involved or one or two then the risk is about 5%. Now, if it's very large, it's growing into the surrounding muscles, there are a lot of lymph nodes involved, then it's 25 to 40% of people are gonna have microscopic disease left behind to have to deal with it later. The treatment for papillary, follicular, and herthal cell, the strategy then is to remove the cancer and then if the patient is intermediate or high risk, to try to go after the microscopic disease. Now, historically, chemotherapy is given to decrease the cancer size and to get at the microscopic disease. For these common types of thyroid cancer, we have an agent that can kill follicular cells if they take it up. And that agent is I-131, the same agent we use to treat hyperthyroid disease. How effective this pill, which is given six weeks after the operation is, depends on how well those cells can take up the iodine, the cancer cells. Now, cancer cells lose some of the ability to take up iodine, and they cannot compete with normal follicular cells. So the strategy is we're going to take out as much normal tissue and as much cancer as we can, and then six weeks later use this radioactive iodine pill. We can get a picture of the uptake in the neck, and if it's elsewhere, we know that there's iodine containing cells outside the neck, that means that it's spread outside the neck. So for papillary thyroid cancer, we don't check before, we check with iodine six weeks after the operation. And this pill, because it's only directed at cells that take up iodine, there are very few complications. It doesn't affect the bone marrow and the immune competency. It doesn't make people sick to their stomach. It doesn't make hair fall out. It is really well tolerated. So between these treatments and the fact that it's slow growing, we can get excellent results. One of the things we do to try to stratify patients before the operation is to do what's called the mapping study, an ultrasound of the lymph nodes on the side of the neck and if you look at those lymph nodes with ultrasounds, you can sometimes see calcium in it, you can sometimes see um, abnormal blood vessels, and if you biopsy it, you'll say, oh, I didn't feel it, but I identified their cancer in these lymph nodes, then at the first operation, you can take out the thyroid and all of those lymph nodes on the side of the neck to decrease the chance that you'll have to do it later. The problem with mapping studies is that it's overly sensitive. It's really good if you're a radiologist and you have to put your kids through college because they're going to do a lot of these. And 
it's going to, for my patients, it's fairly traumatic because we're doing a test looking for more disease. And then there are a lot of false positive lymph nodes that are seen that we biopsy that turn out to be normal. About one in 10 patients will have unsuspected lymph node involvement and it's helpful. The other nine were psychologically torturing. So under the microscope, this is what papillary thyroid cancer looks like. You could see these look like projections. They're not circles here. And you can see in the nucleus, there's a line. These are called nuclear grooves. Here's another one, and here's one. And so you can see nuclear changes with papillary thyroid cancer. And here, you can see this type of cell that's called the other one was called nuclear grooves. These are called nuclear inclusions. And so we can make the diagnosis of papillary thyroid cancer based on three things. The branching, the inclusions, and the grooves. Why do people get papillary thyroid cancer? There are some people who are at high risk. They have a genetic reason. And it occurs in an unpredictable way in certain families. So I've taken care of the grandmother, the mother and the granddaughter, the brother and the sister, the two sisters. If you have a blood relative with papillary thyroid cancer, then that patient will be at an unpredictable higher risk. The other genetic risk factors are that people with papillary thyroid cancer can have these types of cancer, breast, colon, melanoma, lymphoma, and leukemia. And it's not that unusual. Out of all of these, the easiest cancer to treat is the papillary thyroid cancer. There are some environmental factors that predispose to papillary thyroid cancer. One is excessive exposure to ionizing radiation. How do we know that's the case? How do we know that's the case? Well, we know when the atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to try to bring a speedier end to World War II, people who survived the fallout 10, 15 years later had a high incidence of papillary thyroid cancer. An early treatment before there was Accutane, before there was antibiotics, there were radiation treatments to the face. And that was done in the 1930s, 10 years after people got those treatments for their severe acne, they had a high incidence of um, papillary thyroid cancer. When I was growing up, my mother um, was told by the pediatrician it was time for me at age 15 to go to the big boy doctor. Her doctor is who she took me to, and he had in his back room a fluoroscopy machine, which is an x-ray machine in that era. They couldn't save the pictures. So I remember getting fluoroscopy. He didn't find anything abnormal, but if you do that, x-ray indiscriminately on adolescents, you're going to find a shadow over here, and that shadow is called an enlarged thymus gland, which is like a big lymph node, and it's supposed to get smaller as people go through adolescence. Well, there was a concern, if it didn't get smaller, that it would predispose to lymphoma or leukemia. So in the 60s, it was thought you should use radiation treatments to shrink it. And they did that, and it shrunk. And in a fair percentage of those adolescents, 15 years later, had papillary thyroid cancer. So we can define a high-risk patient. Do they have genetic risk factors, or did they have environmental risk factors? And we're going to be more aggressive when we make decisions for high-risk patients. The other types of thyroid cancer is called medullary thyroid cancer. It is hereditary in 50% in a predictable way. If I had it, half my kids would uh, have a chance to get it. It's not based on the follicular cells. It's based on a parafollicular cell called the C-cell. And you can actually make the diagnosis on measuring calcitonin levels. There's no iodine in calcitonin, so you can't treat it with radioactive iodine. It is slow growing. We get high cure rates with operation alone. Half of the hereditary 
variety is associated with cancer and other organs. Anaplastic thyroid cancer is rare. Now this is rapidly growing. It's the only one that's treated with chemotherapy and external beam radiation. And thankfully it is rare. The mainstay for diagnosing thyroid cancer is ultrasound. Ultrasound is done with a probe that has microcrystals in a one millimeter strip. You run a little current over the microcrystals, sound waves are going to come out, they're going to go through the tissue and bounce back. Now, if the nodule is falling apart, as the follicular cells die off, it becomes a big cyst filled with colloid. All the sound waves go through, none bounce back, it looks like a black hole, and then we can tell the patient there's no cancer there. If they're solid, well, we're going to be concerned about it. Because it's a computer-generated image, you can put the cursors on, measure it in three dimensions, and you know its size and shape. Now, there are certain features you can see on ultrasound that would say, hmm, this has a higher likelihood of being cancer. One of them is if you see these little white dots called microcalcifications, one-third of the time, that's a big number, 33% of the time, there's going to be papillary thyroid cancer in the neighborhood. Or you can look at blood vessels, and if there are a lot of blood vessels on the inside, about one-third of the time there's going to be papillary thyroid cancer. So if you saw that, you'd say, oh, it's not 5% for this patient, it's 33%. Fine needle biopsy is a technology that was developed in the 1970s. And you put the needle in, the nodule, you get out little droplets that look like blood, and there are cells and fluid in it, and then the pathologist can give you a diagnosis. With a fine needle biopsy, every result you get every result you get has a but next to it. The pathologist will say, I think it's this, but maybe it's not. Now, the pathologist can only tell you what they're looking at presently. They can't tell you what they haven't seen yet, so it all comes down to do those droplets that the pathologist is looking at, that they spread out on a slide, and stained and looked at its cells, follicular cells, blood, fluid, does it accurately represent the whole nodule? And it's a statistical phenomenon. It's called sampling error. The needle didn't hit, didn't sample the cancer, so it's telling you falsely that it's benign. Every needle biopsy, whenever the pathologist can't look at the whole thing, and sometimes in the operating room, we'll talk about this frozen section, whenever the pathologist can't look at the whole specimen, it's subject to sampling error. Does this sample represent everything that's going on? And so historically, there was an issue. Historically, there was an issue of what diagnosis went with what needle biopsy. Now, that was a problem because pathologists would describe what they'd see and then they put a diagnosis on it. Another pathologist would see the exact same thing and put a different diagnosis. So that was not very helpful. It just led to a lot of opinions with disagreement in the diagnosis. Because that was a major problem 10 years ago, the world's foremost thyroid pathologist who looked at fine needle biopsies got together in Bethesda, Maryland and they created the Bethesda classification to standardize what features went with which diagnostic category and then what that meant clinically. And except for one diagnosis, they did a great job. So we're going to start off with Bethesda 2, which means it's benign. So, there are two benign diagnoses. You've heard about these already from me, goiter and thyroiditis. For a pathologist to say it's benign, one of these two, they have to see follicular cells, colloid, and a certain type of white blood cells. 
they see all three of those, they're going to say it's benign, it's a goiter, and greater than 90, 95% of the time, they're going to be correct, maybe even a higher percentage. It's not 100% because of sampling error. For thyroiditis, they're going to see follicular cells, the pink stuff, colloid, and lymphocytes. And they're going to be accurate about the same amount, maybe a little higher. What do we do with one benign biopsy? We tell the patient, good news, it's benign on this biopsy, you want to see you in three months. What's going to happen in three months? In three months, in three months, we're going to examine the patient again. And if it's getting bigger, I'm going to start recommending either another biopsy right away or an operation. If it's not getting bigger, sometime in the next two years, we're going to do one or two biopsies to make sure we're not dealing with that rare case of an aggressive cancer. Now, what if we diagnose papillary thyroid cancer a year later or even longer? Well, what it really means is our persistence paid off, that we did the right thing. The only bad thing I, I can do with a benign, one benign biopsy is tell the patient to have a good life and then five years later it's a completely different situation. If you follow the patient carefully, it's not getting bigger, it's a slow growing cancer, we're okay. The biology of the disease determines how the patient's going to do. We haven't lost anything. Now Bethesda 5 and 6, I grouped it together for simplicity. It's suspicious for papillary thyroid cancer or papillary thyroid cancer. And you're going to see not the papillary formation, not the branching, but you're going to see those nuclear changes, the grooves and inclusions I showed you. And in the aggregate for both 5 and 6, 95 out of 100 times, there's going to be cancer there. Now 95 is not 100. So every once in a while, I'm going to take out somebody's thyroid gland and the fine needle biopsy said it was going to be cancer and it's not cancer. How does that happen? Well, the pathologists don't see very many other cells with those nuclear changes and they don't see the papillary formation. This is not perfect. This is evidence-based, not perfect answers. If you're an optimist, you're happy you don't have cancer. If you're a pessimist and your thyroid was taken out, you're taking thyroid medication every day either way, but you'll be upset about it. It's understandable. It's the accuracy of the test. These, none of these are perfect tests. We go on statistical analysis. So there's that warning in there that they're not perfect. The issue you have to make with a diagnose of papillary thyroid cancer is how much thyroid should you remove when you get a fine needle biopsy. Now, one of the terms that my patients need to understand is the term microcarcinoma. That means tiny cancer. Usually it's less than a centimeter. A centimeter is about this big. So, with a microcarcinoma, one microcarcinoma confined to the thyroid, the cure rate is 99%. Now the thing about microcarcinoma is why every one of my patients who's facing an operation should know about it is because it's in the background of a lot of people's thyroid. So I can operate for a big goiter. One third of the time, the pathologist will say, oh, there was a two millimeter papillary microcarcinoma because the cure rate is 99%, you don't need radioactive iodine, and you're going to be fine. Okay, how much thyroid should we remove when you have a fine needle biopsy? Now, the way we treat papillary thyroid cancer is to take advantage of the fact that the pituitary hormone, TSH, makes thyroid tissue grow. It'll make cancer grow. So anybody who has thyroid cancer is going to be placed on thyroid hormone. 
So the question is, if we only took out one lobe that had the cancer, you'd still be taking thyroid hormone. Why? To drive down the TSH. The pituitary would say, oh, you got plenty of thyroid hormone in your blood. We want the TSH to be lower than normal without you being hyperthyroid. That's the strategy for everybody, whether it's big or a large cancer, whether they need radioactive iodine or not, you're going to be treated with thyroid hormone. So you don't want to save a lobe to avoid being treated, if you have cancer, with thyroid hormone, you're going to get it. You have to make a decision should you remove one side or both sides. And that's all determined on what is the risk for residual disease. Are you going to need radioactive iodine treatment because there's a high chance of the residual microscopic disease getting bigger and, be, and being not noticed later? Now, by size criteria, if it's small, you probably won't need it. But that's not the only criteria. The pathologist is going to look and say, well, it's growing into little blood vessels. So even if it's a small cancer, one and a half, two centimeters, and it's growing into little blood vessels, well, you need to be treated with radioactive iodine. Now keep in mind what I said before, you cannot be treated with radioactive iodine if you have a half a normal thyroid in it because all the I-131 will go to that lobe. So that means if we took out half your thyroid and you need radioactive iodine, we have a return trip to the operating room to take out more thyroid tissue. And then six weeks later, you can be treated with radioactive iodine. So that can be a difficult decision. Okay, Bethesda 1, that category means that there's no follicular cells, insufficient. What do we do with that? Well, if it is solid on ultrasound, we're going to operate. If it's cystic or partially cystic and solid, um, I usually recommend that we follow it and see what happens to the solid components. If they decrease, it's a degenerating nodule, it's not cancer. If it increases, the solid component increases, we'll do another biopsy. If it's totally solid, we can't get a needle in and get out cells, we're never going to get an answer with a fine needle biopsy. That means an operation. Now, Bethesda 3 and 4 are the most complicated ones. These are called indeterminate. And the reason they're called indeterminate is because the pathologist is limited in what they can tell you on a fine needle biopsy because you can't make a diagnosis of follicular or herthal cell cancer. Herthal cell is a type of follicular cell that stains pinker and the nucleus is a little off to the side. The criteria for saying it's follicular or herthal cell cancer, you have to see the cancer growing outside the capsule of the nodule, the border of the nodule, or growing into a blood vessel. And you can't see those features on a fine needle biopsy. So here's the border, and you can see this is the solid sheet of tumor cells going right through the border, and this would be classified as a minimally invasive follicular cancer. And here, this is a blood vessel, and you can see right in the middle of the blood vessel are these cells. Now you can't make this diagnosis on anything but solid tissue. So here's the Bethesda classification in its earlier version, it's 1 through 6, Bethesda 4, the old term was neoplasm. So when pathologists couldn't give you a diagnosis, they put a Latin name on it. And the name they used was neoplasm, which means new growth. The risk of cancer for that diagnosis is 15 to 30 percent. What do you do with that number? Well, you can't let it sit there. If they tell you, then you have to figure out what to do. Now, in this day and age, you can take a fine needle biopsy specimen and send it to a company, and there are three of them. There are three of them 
that will do molecular genetics on it. And the three companies are Verisite, ThyroSeq, and Interpace. Verisite's located in Texas. Their analysis, they call the Affirma biopsy. They look at 148 different genes, 28 of which are sometimes associated with cancer. If they see none of those gene mutations associated with cancer, they're going to say your risk is not 25% anymore, it's 5%. If they see at least one of them, they're going to tell you it's over 40 operate. Okay. ThyroSeq will give you a different answer that was developed at my alma mater, the University of Pittsburgh. They'll tell you what genes they see. For Verocyte, you got to pay them extra to get a few gene specifics back. But for ThyroSeq, they'll say we see KRAS, we see NRAS. The risk of cancer is 65.37%. None of these assays tell you it's zero or 100. The higher the, once you get above a certain number, it's going to force you to operate. Interpace does it a little differently. They'll take the slide, the exact piece of glass. The other two work on a fresh needle stick. Interpace will take your slide, they'll split it open, scrape the cells off, and do an assay and give you a percentage. The good news is they're doing the assay on the same material the pathologist looked at. The disadvantage is no one's ever looking at that slide again. They will take a picture of it and save it for us. Now, Bethesda 3 and 4, you could operate, and the older way to do this was to operate and then wait four or five days later and get the final report, and if there was no cancer there and you just took out the one side and there was no cancer, it's fine. If the remaining thyroid tissue was healthy, you may not need to take thyroid medication, and the risks of operating on one side are less than the risk of operating on both sides. Now, we fine-tuned it here by doing a frozen section. There are some pathologists who won't look at a frozen section because of the sampling error. But if the pathologist doesn't see any cancer on the one or two pieces they looked at while the patient's in the operating room, frozen section, the patient's asleep in the operating room, we remove the tissue, we send it up to the pathologist, they freeze it, they slice it, they stain it, and look at it. If they see signs of cancer, there's cancer there. If they don't see signs of cancer, they're going to be accurate about 80 plus percent of the time. That means when they look at the whole thing later, they may change it 20 or less percent of the time. And if the patient needs radioactive iodine, well, then we have to go back and take out the other side. What do I do? If the patient's high risk or the ultrasound's high risk, I don't bother with these tests. Um, I'll recommend an operation because you're already at 33%. That's a big number. Now, a lot of times the patient will come to me with this assay done and then we can't avoid it. I like to have my pathologist do a second opinion on the previous biopsies that were done. They'll look at the same slides that were done. There are some pathologists who are afraid to say it's benign. They don't want to get sued because of the sampling error. They don't think patients can understand that. My patients can understand sampling error. My pathologists are not afraid to say it's benign. And one study we did showed 25% of the time when the outside pathologist labeled it a inter indeterminate three or four. My pathologist said, no, it's benign. And we spared the patient an operation. They do the second opinion, say it's benign, but we have a positive molecular genetic assay we're operating. Because I can't ignore that statistical analysis of molecular genetics. So if the patient's high risk, the ultrasound's high risk, I recommend a lobectomy with frozen section. There are some patients who will say to me, look, um, I don't want any risk of going back. 
take out both sides. If there are nodules on both sides, we should take out both sides. And I'll listen to the, to the patients and what they prefer me to do. Okay, we're going to talk about operations and informed consent. Informed consent are dis is a discussion with the patient of what are the risks of the operation. And there are two categories of risks. One is anesthetic risks. What's my health like? How am I going to do with the anesthetic? And the other risks are what structures are nearby that have the potential to be injured? So anesthetic risks, what are the coexisting conditions? If I have blockages in my coronary arteries, my heart attack is waiting to happen, the general anesthesia could induce it. If I have disease in these arteries bringing blood to my brain, I could have a stroke if my blood pressure fluctuates a lot. If I spent my life smoking, I could have lung problems afterwards in addition to stroke and heart attacks. And if my kidneys don't work right, I could have bleeding as a potential complication. What do I do about that? I want to hear from your doctors. I want them to tell me how they think you'll do with general anesthesia. If you spent your life smoking, you have bad COPD, or you're predisposed to a stroke, I can actually do your operation by at the beginning of the operation numbing up all the nerves to your neck, here and here. You won't feel sharp pain. It's like being in the dentist's office. Now, there are advantages to going to sleep. I personally don't like being in the dentist chair. I go. It's important. I don't like the sounds in, the, in there, the whirring of the drill. But if it's the difference between a stroke or lung problems, you should have it done that way. Take advantage of the fact that we can take away your sharp pain. There's an anesthesiologist there to give you pain medication, and we can do it successfully that way. Nearby structures. One of them are the parathyroid glands. There are these tiny glands nearby, sometimes inside the thyroid, sometimes behind it, above or below, that control the amount of calcium in the blood. If all four of those are injured or removed, you could have to take calcium and vitamin D three or four times a day forever. What's the chance if I do your operation that's going to happen? Less than 1%. You only need one of these. Most people have four. There are nerves that go to the vocal cords. There are nerves at the top, and I'll show you an illustration, that tense up the vocal cords. If you can sing alto soprano, you need those nerves. I've operated on people who sing for a living, and we've had good results. The chance that I'm going to injure one of those nerves that tense the vocal cords, less than 1%. If you sing like I do, that nerve isn't going to make a difference. For people whose those nerves don't work, they can perceive a difference in their voice. People around them can't. Now there's another nerve that comes up from the chest that opens the vocal cords. So the vocal cords are going to open like that. And if one of those nerves are damaged, the vocal cord um, can't open. And people will have hoarseness or their voice will get tired. All comers, in my practice, the chance that I'm going to permanently damage those nerves is less than 2%. That includes people who have, like that first person I showed you with that massive goiter, should have had their operation years ago. It includes people who have cancer wrapped around the nerve and I can't separate it. And it includes people with severe thyroiditis that, you know, I need my hammer and chisel. Now, the nerve is very delicate. To give you a frame of reference, if the nerve doesn't branch, it's as big as a thin spaghetti. If it branches twice, each one's like an angel hair pasta. If it branches three times, each one's the size of a hair. As it branches, it's more and more delicate. If the thyroid tissue is struck to, stuck to it, it could get stretched. And if it gets stretched or swollen, it may not work for a while. It could look perfectly normal and not work. I'll explain what we do about it in a, in a minute. If that nerve is injured on the both sides, then the patient can't breathe. The opening between the vocal cords is too small and people have to breathe through a hole in the windpipe called the tracheostomy. This is where I knock wood and say I've not had to do 
an unplanned permanent tracheostomy on any of the thousand patients I've operated on. So here's the illustration. This is the main nerve that opens the vocal cords. This is that top nerve I was telling you about, the external branch. Here's a parathyroid gland. Now the parathyroid glands need this little blood vessel to stay alive. If you have to tie off the blood vessel like was done here, you can take this little parathyroid out, chop it up, make parathyroid Julien, and put it back in. In about three months, it'll work. That's called the autotransplant of the parathyroid tissue. When I operate, see these little blood vessels going to it? I have to lift this up gently. It's about the size of an eraser on a pencil and incredibly delicate. And so I have to leave it hanging with the thyroid out on this um, blood vessel, so it'll stay alive. Now the parathyroid glands, because they're so delicate, can get swollen and not work for a while. So permanent damage where you don't have any parathyroid tissue, less than 1%, about 5% of my patients will get temporarily a low calcium. And 20 years ago, people were in the hospital for three, four days, every six hours, put your arm out, we're drawing blood, we're going to measure your calcium in your blood, and if it got too low, we'd give you calcium. Now, two-thirds of my patients go home the same day. We tell them before the operation, go to the grocery store, get calcium citrate, Citracal, with D. Temporarily, we're going to want you to take it after the operation four times a day. Not with your thyroid medication, but with breakfast, lunch, dinner, before you go to bed at night. If the calcium gets low in your blood, it won't be a secret to you, you'll get these weird sensations. You'll get tingling in your fingertips, around your lips, and your hands will cramp up. As Soon as you get those symptoms, I'll be available to you. You get in touch with me. We'll tell you what to do. If you take the calcium immediately following the operation and you temporarily get a low calcium, we can manage it as an outpatient. If you don't, start taking the calcium right away, you may wind up getting intravenous calcium, calcium and have a long hospital. To avoid nerve injury, we do the following. We're going to leave a little bit of thyroid tissue along the course of the nerve. If possible, that's why I prefer not to take out both sides unless we have a good reason, because if you don't touch the nerve on that side, if you don't touch the thyroid, you're going to have two virgin parathyroids and there's no risk to the nerve on that side. And the other thing we can do is we have the equipment and the technology to measure and to monitor the function of those nerves. And the way we do that is called nerve monitoring. We do that with a breathing tube that goes in while the patient's asleep. Now this little thing is what the vocal cords, an illustration of what the vocal cords look like. Here's the vocal cords. So when we put the patient to sleep, we have a tube similar to this and we match up where these little wires are embedded into it so it's at the level of the vocal cords. These wires get hooked up to a computer and I have a technician in the room from Accurate Monitoring, it's the name of the company, and I can stimulate and test the nerves. And there are times when the nerve will look beautiful and I stimulate it but it doesn't work. It's perfect. That means it got stretched or swollen, and it will work again. When will it work again? Well, sometimes in an hour, sometimes in a year, commonly six weeks. So unless we're dealing with an aggressive cancer, I may say, today we're gonna, we plan to do both sides, we're only gonna do one, because I don't wanna risk that nerve on the other side getting stretched. What do we mean by a minimally invasive thyroidectomy? Well, it's like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. For me, it's outpatient, for two-thirds of my patient, unless we're going to do a very big operation, remove lymph nodes on the side of the neck, <clears throat> called the modified neck dissection, or we have a large goiter, it's growing down in the chest. When we do it as an outpatient, we send the patient home with calcium with D four times a day, and then we teach them what the symptoms of low calcium are like. I make the smallest incision I can to safely take it out, and we're going to put it in a line that's in the neck. And the hope there is when the swelling goes down and the color fades, it's going to disappear in that line. Now, I can't promise how small an incision, because if the thyroid gland is very large, it's not coming out of a small incision. 
a normal sized gland I can take out through an incision this big. But if I can't see the nerves well, I'm not going to wake you up and say, is it okay if I make it bigger? I'm going to do what needs to be done. So there are no promises. I use glue on the outside. Glue is good, keeps the moisture in, it helps healing, and it allows you to take a shower 24 hours later. If you do sedentary work, you're going to be back to work in a week to 10 days. If you do heavy lifting, you'll be at a month, a month and a half. If you exercise regularly, you can run, you could use an elliptical machine, a stationary bike, but no pumping iron or sit-ups. We'll want to see you back in a week or two after the operation. Our practice is out of Rutgers. We're not great answering the phone just yet. Email works very well. Make sure that you get my card or the advanced practice nurse I work with get her card as well and email both of us. She may get to it before I do. I'm going to call you the day before the operation and I have a 610 area code. There are some people who they don't recognize the number, they won't pick up the call. The day before, you see a 610 area code, it's me, pick it up. Um, don't get frustrated, email will save you. You can, if you don't get a response from me in about five hours, I probably didn't get it because I check very frequently. And I look forward to seeing you and answering your questions directly in the office. Take care and have a good day.